So as I was studying these verses from 1 Corinthians we're going to look at in chapter 10, I happened to have the Olympics on in the background. And one of the events I have absolutely, if you can call it that, one of the games I love watching the most is Team USA basketball because they just destroy everyone, usually, usually. And it took me back in time to the height of my basketball career, which was eighth grade. All right? <laughs> hear me out. Hear me out. I thought I'd be the next Larry Bird. I thought I would be on Team USA someday. That was a dream. As you can see, that dream didn't quite happen. But, but I was thinking about that, in particular, a tournament that we were in. So our team that year was actually pretty good. We had height, we had ball handlers, we had shooters. It was a pretty all-around solid team. We beat just about everybody we played. And one of our biggest tournaments of the year, breeze through the competition, get to the championship, and we're facing this tiny school from a small town. This, this, so this team, six guys, right? All five foot four and shorter. And we're thinking, oh, this will be easy. This is like Team USA versus South Sudan. Easy money. We're going to win this game, win this tournament. Not a problem. Now, you'd think logic, and eighth grade boys don't have it, but <laughs> logic of, you know, they made it to the championship game. They're probably pretty good. Didn't cross our minds. Didn't take long for us to realize how good they were. All these guys, six of them, five foot four and under, they could shoot like you wouldn't believe. Just tenacity on defense. Full court press the entire game. I don't know how they had the endurance to play, but they did. All the way through, they ran us out of the gym. And it wasn't particularly pretty, right? We got complacent, we didn't take him seriously, and we got burned. And I was going back in time thinking about that memory. It really applies to what we're talking about today, where we're going. And that's when it comes to temptation, when it comes to the opponents that you and I face every day, Satan, sin, death, do we take them seriously? Do we have a temptation game plan? Or do we go into it thinking, you know what, I'm going to try to avoid all that, do we go into it thinking, well, I'm just going to fall to it anyway. Might as well just get it over with. Do you have a plan? Because think about it. Satan has been strategizing against you your entire life. He knows all your weak points. He knows how to trigger you. He knows how to get under your skin. And are we prepared to fight back? And how do we fight back? That's what we're going to talk about today. And if you're thinking right now, you know what? Yes, I've been struggling with this sin for a long time. And I've never felt like I'm prepared to face it. Well, then you can relate to the Corinthians too. Because the Corinthians had the same problem. They didn't, either, they didn't have a game plan, or the one that they had, they didn't take Satan seriously enough. They weren't prepared. And so as you think about Corinth, I just want to set the stage, just so you understand this church a little bit. And what you'll come to discover, as I did, we're really not all that different from them. So this is kind of a, a computer rendering of what Corinth could have looked like at the time of Paul. Now, tell me if any of this sounds familiar. A city where people from all over the world are moving there. A city that always has something going on. It could be 2 a.m. and there's still people out and about. A city that loves sports that you wouldn't believe. Does any of that sound familiar? A little bit, right? South Florida-esque in a way, right? But not only that, the Christians in this city were something else. This was a group of believers from all walks of life. They loved God's word. They loved being generous with their wealth. These were people who were more welcoming than you could ever imagine. Like they loved having new people come in. And does any of that sound familiar? Maybe, <laughs> maybe Divine Savior Church, maybe you and I, Christians in West Palm Beach, Florida, aren't that much different than Christians in Corinth 2,000 years ago. And that's the point Paul wants to make first, that really when we talk about temptation and struggling with sin, we're all the same. Notice how he puts this. He says very clearly, notice how many times he uses the word all and same. He says, for I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Now, what Paul's doing here, he's connecting the Corinthians to the Old Testament Israelites, right? What he's saying is these Corinthians who came to worship for the first time once, got into a star class with their version of it, taking communion after understanding the significance of what that Lord's Supper is, they had this unity with God, unity with each other, and he's saying, look, just like you, the Israelites had all that as well. They had this unity with God, this closeness, the same spiritual word, the same rock that it was built on, which is Jesus. They had all that. But maybe at this point, I could just imagine, you know, somebody in that Corinthian congregation hearing this letter from Paul being read to them, thinking, okay, I get it, like, we're kind of the same, I understand that, but come on, the Israelites? The Israelites, these people who grumbled against God all the time were flat out idiotic in some cases, didn't listen to anything he had to say, I'm not like that, I'm not as silly as them, the things they did, the things they thought, come on, that's not me. Well, then Paul kind of says it point blank, right? He just cuts the chase and says, no, that is you. Notice what he says next. He says, now these things, 
All these things in the Old Testament, all the consequences for their sin occurred as examples to keep us. And he puts himself in there too, us, from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Really? Think about what Paul's saying there. He's saying all the things in the Old Testament, all the times that God made sure that the writers recorded the times the Israelites failed, didn't take Satan seriously, the consequences for their sin, he wrote all that stuff down for me? <laughs> for you? Yeah. That's what Paul's saying. And again, if you're like me, I look at this, I'm thinking, okay, come on. I, I'm not like them, Paul. I'm not, I haven't done silly things like them. I understand, yes, we have the sin problem. I understand that we have the same spiritual blessings, but come on, the foolish things they did, that can't be me. And so Paul makes it abundantly clear even more. He walks through two of the most, the sins that we can all relate to, I think, more than any, to be quite honest. The first sin is, do not be idolaters just as some of them. He starts with the very first commandment. Now again, if you know the Israelite story, they're on Mount Sinai right there. They're at the base of the mountain. God is up there thundering. Moses is getting the Ten Commandments. So what are they doing underneath? Does anybody know? They're going to go in calf, right? Making a golden cow statue and worshiping it. Right after God had taken them through Egypt, out of slavery, down past the Red Sea. He had done all those things, and they were worshiping a cow god. And at this point, if you're like me, I'm thinking, well, see, that right there, I'm not like them. I don't have some handmade heifer god on my dinner table that I say grace to every night. That is not me, God. Nope. But let me ask you this, and this is the question I ask myself. Have you ever worried in your life? <laughs> you know, worry is one of those things we kind of write off. This is the whole, again, complacency thing, right? The whole not taking sin seriously. Oh, come on, everybody worries. Everybody does that. It's not that big of a deal. But think about what you're saying when you worry. What you're saying to God is, God, I know you're on the throne, but are you really? Are you really in control of this? Because it doesn't seem like you are. And we worry about our kids and the, the life that they're going to have. And we worry about our country. We worry about our church. We worry about all these things, our health, our wealth, all of it. What are we saying to God? Can I really trust you? Or do I need to find my way to handle this on my own? That's what worry is. Is it not? It's taking God off the throne. In fact, idolatry is not just having a false God statue in front of you. Idolatry is any time you prioritize someone or something above God. And why is that such a big deal? Because if we're not looking to God as our source of joy and strength and confidence and wisdom, we get lost, we get confused, and life hurts. It's true. So if you haven't been convicted yet, <laughs> I know I am, but Paul doesn't stop there. He goes to the next one. He goes to the Sixth Commandment. He says, we should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. Now, why in the world would Paul go from the First Commandment to the Sixth? Well, think about it. The Corinthian congregation, and you see our culture today, we struggle with understanding how God designed sexuality. We do. It's obvious, right? And I, I've counseled a lot, especially young men, through addictions to pornography. And it's one of the things I hear all the time at the front end. They'll say to me, you know what, Pastor, I understand that, yes, lusting is wrong, but come on, at least I'm not actually having sex with someone. I'm just in my room. I'm in my office. It's not that big of a deal, but it is. See, there it is. We're trying to, again, make it seem like the temptation Satan's putting in front of us is either, one, not lethal, which it is, or two, maybe this is a healthy way of, I don't know, I have this urge. I have this craving. I have to get it out somehow, but that's not what God says, or, or I've even counseled women who have romance novels, and they say, yeah, you know, I know there's raunchy stuff in there, but like, I just, at least it's some way, right, again, an outlet for me, but is that it? When you're texting your friends, I've had high school students I've talked to, oh, it's just a snap, it's just a text, it's not that big of a deal, Pastor, but it is. Why does God talk about sex so much in the Bible? It's because sex is so significant, because it really is this designed to be an amazing illustration of God's connection with his church, where you are just literally one body. That's the idea. There's so much. It's not just about pleasure. Yes, it's a part of it, but the main thing of it is this commitment to each other, this ability to say, your body is just as important as mine. I'm going to care for you as I care for my own body. It's amazing. But in our culture, we minimize it. And really, that's what temptations always do. Temptations minimize and trivialize how God's designed the world to be. Or all of a sudden, it's, Satan has a really, he's a contortionist in a way. He makes everything seem so, you know, God says, yeah, that's restrictive. That's not going to bring you happiness. I can give you something way better. And of course, he has an ally within, right? We have that sinful nature that's like, yes, absolutely, I'll follow that. But again, maybe you've heard me use this before. I got this from Pastor Mike Novotny. STP versus LTP. Satan runs after short-term pleasure for us, long-term pain. 
And with God, it's short-term pain and long-term pleasure when you think about heaven, but that's it. And again, if all of this, you're looking at this and saying, wow, I mean, what hope is there for me? Because I've fallen victim to all these things. And then <laughs> Paul comes in with a gut punch. He says, let us not put them aside to the test, just as some of them put him to the test or are being destroyed by the snakes. In other words, has this thought ever crossed your mind? Whatever, and I want you to really apply this personally. What is that sin? Identify it, or sins. They're on your mind the most. You struggle with the most. Think about those things, and now think about this. Has the thought ever crossed your mind? It has for me. God, if you really love me, why do I have to even have temptation? Or if I do have temptation, then why don't you ever, I pray for you to help me, and I don't seem to have any help. Has that thought ever crossed your mind? Like, God, if, if I'm chosen by you, and I am, and I'm a part of your family, then why am I going through this? <laughs> what possible good could come through this struggle? Why not just take it away from me? I could be done with it. That's just like what the Israelites did. Lord, why did you take us out of Egypt? Remember the grumbling and complaining? Why did you take us out of Egypt? It's forgetting who God is. It's putting them aside of the test, not trusting his goodness, his grace for us. That's what we do. We tend to maximize our problems to the point that we think our temptations, our, our struggles are so beyond. We never say it, but sometimes we think, God, are you capable of giving me the strength to get through this? And again, if you don't think this is talking about you, I'm going to go back to that. We saw this verse earlier. Again, it was written down as what? Warnings for us, right? On whom the culmination of the ages has come. That's talking about Jesus. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. And that's where I look at this and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, wow, I am so inadequate. Because <laughs> that is me. How often I take God for granted. How often I do make this temptation struggle so big that I feel like I'm alone in this. How often I fall short. And if that's where you're at right now, you have that despair in you, then the law has done its work. Notice, Paul spends a lot of time on law because he wants to expose the sin we have. We need to expose that so we can heal. And look at how God begins that healing process here. The very next verse, he says, no temptation has seized you except that which is common to humanity. In other words, if you think that what you're dealing with right now, no one's ever gone through it, and Satan's really good at kind of framing that in your mind, right? No one understands this. I'm the only one who understands this. I'm going through this all alone. He's saying, nope. <laughs> The temptation you're facing, people have faced throughout all time. And really what he's saying is, is God has Satan on a leash. He does. He has boundaries. Satan can't go past those boundaries. And God is using those temptations for an amazing purpose. But he doesn't stop there. How can we know that God is using these things for our good? Because God is faithful. When Paul uses that word faithful, he wants to bring to mind all the promises God's ever made. You look at the Bible from the smallest promises to the most grand, God kept every one, every single one. You think about your life, right? The times when you felt you didn't have people there for you, the times you didn't feel like you had enough even materially. When Jesus promises that he'll care for you, if he cares for even the birds of the air, you don't think he's gonna care for you, and he provides for you in ways you never saw coming. Now sometimes it's such a great thing. You wanna think about God's grace and make it personal. Go back, do an inventory of your life, and see all those unexpected things that God did that were coincidental, that you didn't see coming, that seemed like happenstance, they are not. <laughs> he always comes through with his promises. And if that's the only gospel he had for us here, that'd be amazing, but he takes it one step further, doesn't he? And I change this to first person because I think it just really hits home. Imagine God saying this to you, right? I will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, I will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Now, this is a passage that people say, well, look, this is the God believes in you passage. God is our life coach. He's on the sideline motivating us. You can do it. You won't be tempted beyond what you can bear. Yes, it's true. God promises you won't face temptation that's beyond capability. But this has nothing to do with your capability, does it? How is there no temptation beyond what we can bear? because he's providing the way out, because he's the one who's with us, because it's his capability that matters. This verse is not saying, all right, mano a mano against Satan, it's on you. No, it's saying the exact opposite. No, it's you and Jesus, with Jesus fighting for you, that is the battle, right? And I know I talked about this before, but just, I think we gloss over this so quickly, the fact that Jesus never sinned a single time. And we say it kind of with passing, oh yeah, Jesus lived a perfect life for me, died, whatever. Think about that. <laughs> Think about never making a single mistake. Think about never, ever falling to temptation. Think about always doing the right thing, thinking the right thing all the time about everybody. That's amazing. But what's even more incredible is why he did it. What was his motivation? It's you. It's loving you. 
He went through every trial. Don't think for a minute that just in Luke chapter 4, that's when Jesus was tempted by the devil. He was tempted the moment he entered the world. Satan brought everything he could at him, every last bit of his arsenal, and he never fell a single time because he loves you too much. He wouldn't fail. He wouldn't fail to give you heaven, give you joy, give you forgiveness. And that right there is the difference. That's the game plan. Every other, there's a lot of different ways you can kick addiction, kick struggles. There's a lot of different philosophies, therapy. The Christian difference is this. Every one of those is really a fear motivator. You think about it. Why do people want to kick addiction? Well, I'm afraid this could ruin my family life. This could ruin my career. I don't want to be that guy who's so weak that I have to deal with this my whole life. Fear, fear, fear. Now, what's the Christian motivation when we face struggle and trial and temptation and addiction, etc.? I love Jesus. And I know how much Jesus loves me, and compared to him, whatever this struggle is, it's incomparable. <laughs> I have the God of the universe who loves me. Even if I lost everything tomorrow, I still have Jesus. And that right there, and you face temptation in your life, thinking much of God. It changes everything. It makes that, it puts it into perspective. Compared to who Jesus is, what he's done, his power, his grace, his love for me, that struggle is, t- it's so small. <laughs> it's not this overwhelming thing, I'll never get through this. I have the Son of God at my side. The King of Kings, who never lost a mere skirmish with the devil, not once. And he's, and what I love about Jesus is he's so real. He, I mean, with point blank, right? But when you are tempted, it's true, it's inevitable. You'll be tempted, you'll face trial, but don't be afraid of that. In fact, this is really too part of the Christian difference when it comes to temptation. Is looking at temptations not as things that you want to avoid? Temptations as things that you just, well, I just got to cope with it. Be complacent, I'll deal with it. No, it's seeing them as opportunities and blessings. Now, maybe you've heard this quote before. It's been accredited to several different people, but temptations are like birds flying over your head. (laughs) You can't control the birds flying over your head, but you can control how long you look at them, how much you think of them. Temptations will happen in your life, but instead of having your thoughts focused on the birds, if you will, focusing on Jesus, think about what Jesus has promised you in your life. Yeah, he has a cross of his own choosing for you, but the whole idea of that is to drive you back to him. This is where Satan must go nuts. When our trials and our struggles, can you relate to this, that sometimes those are the closest moments we have with God? (laughs) That just has to tick him off. That all of a sudden, all these trials and temptations he thinks are gonna drive us away from God actually bring us back to his word, back into the Bible, back to the sacraments, back to remembering what he's done for us, back to his love that's self-sacrificing and perfect and never failing. So whatever temptation it is for you, whatever struggle you have, and I really want you to think about this this week and the rest of your life, quite honestly, your game plan, it really is two simple things. Thinking much of God, thinking much what Jesus has done, and finally, when you can't hear him, when you can't seem to have those thoughts, then go back into the Bible, open it, see where the page lands. (laughs) Go into the Psalms especially, and see the struggles they had, and they admit that. And in that transparency, see the love that is beyond real and intentional and authentic and true. That's it, friends. That's it. Temptation is not this insurmountable enemy. No, but see it as an opportunity where God uses that. We pray, lead us not into temptation, which is really us saying, lead us through it. Mold us, grow us, so we can be more like you, Jesus. Our thoughts can be your thoughts. Our speech can be your speech. Our actions can be your hands, reaching out to a world that's craving the hope that we have. That's what we get to do. So it is true, yes, in one side, the law of this, when we get complacent with sin, we can drift away, and Satan attacks that. That's why I tell people, some of you are gonna be in the start class on Wednesday. You'll hear me say this then too. When people start getting into the Christian faith, and they, t- they tend to think, kinda, you know, naively, oh, life will get easier. <laughs> no, it's not. The more you get into God's word, the closer you get to him, Satan is gonna get his talons out, and he's gonna try to dig into you, but you don't have to be afraid, all right? Keep your eyes wide open. Remember that, yes, he wants to cut you off from God. The sooner he can do that, the better, but you don't have to be afraid. Because why? Because Jesus is fighting for you. You're not a solo warrior in the arena. You have the king of kings fighting for you. Charles Spurgeon put it like this. There is no believer who fights sin alone. Jesus is in the trenches with us, bearing our burdens and fighting our battles. His presence is our assurance of victory. It is true. You are fighting from victory, not for victory. You're not a victim anymore. You don't have a victim mindset like so many of us have, and I at times too do as well. But we shouldn't think that way. We're not victims. We stand with the king of kings who conquered death itself, and Satan can't touch that reality. So dear temptation fighters, you go into it this week. Don't go into it thinking, oh, woe is me, or go into it thinking, you know what, I'm just gonna try to get through it, and I'll see the opportunity God's put there. 
to be close to him, to see Jesus fighting, to see as you overcome temptation, such a powerful illustration of God's grace working in your life, and know that the victory is yours because Jesus never loses. And all God's people said, amen.